Well, it is a happy day, but it is also a sad day. It's a happy day because I'm going to read you Chapter 7 of Finn Family R Moving Troll, written and illustrated by Duvi Anson, published by Puffin. But it is a sad day. It's a sad day because Chapter 7 is the last chapter. I'm sorry about that, but we won't get to the end unless I read it. We need to know, because Chapter 7 is very long and describes Snufkin's departure. How the contents of the mysterious suitcase were revealed. How Moomin Mama found her handbag and arranged a party to celebrate it. Finally, how the Hobgoblin arrived in the Valley of the Moomins. And it is a long one. It would make perfect sense for you to stop it in the middle somewhere. And listen to it over two bits if you wanted to. I shan't take offence if you do that. However, I shall read it in one go. And then I shall do something else for a bit. Chapter 7. It was the end of August, the time when owls hoot at night and flurries of bats swoop noiselessly over the garden. Moomin Wood was full of glowworms and the sea was disturbed. There was expectation and a certain sadness in the air. The harvest moon came up huge and yellow. Moomin Troll had always liked those last weeks of summer most, but he didn't really know why. The wind and the sea had changed their tone. There was a new feeling in the air. The trees stood waiting and Moomin Troll wondered if something strange was going to happen. He'd woken up and lay looking at the ceiling, thinking about the sunshine and that it must be quite early in the morning. And then he turned his head and he saw that Snufkin's bed was empty. And at that moment he heard the secret signal under his window, a long whistle and two short ones, which meant, what are your plans for today? Moomin Troll jumped out of bed and looked out of the window. The sun hadn't reached the garden yet. It looked cool and enticing down there. Snufkin was waiting. Pee-hoo, said Moomin Troll, very quietly, so as not to wake anybody. He clambered down the rope ladder. They said hello to each other, then wandered down to the river. And they sat on the bridge with their legs dangling over the water. The sun had ridden over the treetops by this time, and it shone right into their eyes. We sat just like this in the spring, said Moomin Troll. Do you remember? We'd woken up from our winter sleep and it was the very first day. All the others were still asleep. Snufkin nodded. He was busy making reed boats and sailing them down the river. Where are they going? asked Moomin Troll. To places where I'm not, Snufkin answered, as one after another the little boats swirled away around the bend of the river, disappeared, loaded with cinnamon. Shark's teeth and emeralds, said Moomin Troll. You talked of plans, he went on. Have you got any yourself? Yes, said Snufkin. I have a plan, but it's a lonely one, you know. Moomin Troll looked at him for a long time. And then he said, Are you thinking of going away? Now. Immediately, said Snufkin, throwing all the reed boats into the water at once, and he jumped down from the bridge and he sniffed the morning air. It was a good day to start a journey. The crest of the hill beckoned to him in the sunshine, with a road winding up and disappearing on the other side to find a new valley, and then a new hill. Moomin Troll stood looking on while Snufkin packed up his tent. Are you staying away long? he asked. No, said Snufkin. On the first day of spring, I shall be here again, whistling under your window. A year goes by so quickly. Yes, said Sn Cheer Moomin Troll. Cheerio then. So long, said Snufkin. Moomin Troll was left alone on the bridge. He watched Snufkin growing smaller and smaller and at last disappear amongst the silver poplars and the plum trees. And after a while he heard the mouth organ playing all small beasts should have bows in their tail. And then he knew that his friend was happy. He waited while the music grew fainter and fainter, till at last it was quite quiet. And then he trotted back through the dewy garden. On the veranda steps he found Thingamy and Bob curled up in the sunshine. Good morning, Truman Mull, said Thingamy. Good morning, Bingamy and Fob, answered Moomin Troll, who'd now mastered Thingamy and Bob's strange language. Are you crying? asked Bob. N no, said Moomin Troll. It is only that Snufkin has gone away. Oh dear, Potter Witty, said Thingamy sympathetically. Would it cheer you up to nest Bob on the coast? 
So Moo Min Troll kissed Bob kindly on the nose, but it didn't make him feel any happier. And then they put their heads together and they whispered for a long time and then Bob announced solemnly, We've decided to show you the contents of the suitcase, asked Moo Min Troll. Fingerme and Bob nodded eagerly. Come with us, they said, and they scuttled away under the hedge. Moo and Troll crawled after them, discovered they'd made a secret hiding place in the thickest part of the shrubbery. They had padded it with swans down, decorated it with shells and small white stones. It was rather dark in there. Nobody passing the hedge would have suspected there was a secret hiding place on the other side. On a straw mat stood Thingamy and Bob's suitcase. That's the Snort Maiden's mat, observed Moo Moo Troll. She was looking for it only yesterday. Oh yes, agreed Bob happily. We found it, but she doesn't know, of course. Hmm, said Moo Moo Troll. Now weren't you going to show me what you've got in your suitcase? They nodded delightedly, and standing on either side of the suitcase said solemnly, Giddy, steady, row! And the lid opened with a snap. Goodness gracious me, exclaimed Moomin Troll. A soft red light lit up the whole place, and before him lay a ruby as big as a panther's head, glowing like the sunshine, like the sunset, sorry, like living fire. Do you like it very much? asked Thingamy. Yes, said Moomin Troll faintly. And now you won't cry any more, will you? said Bob. Moomin Troll shook his head. Thingamy and Bob sighed contentedly and settled down to gaze at their precious stone. They stared in silent rapture at it. The ruby changed colour all the time. At first it was quite pale and then suddenly a pink glow would flow over it like the sunrise on a snow-capped mountain. And then again crimson flames shot out of its heart. It seemed like a great black tulip with stamens of fire. Oh, if only Snuffkin could see it, sighed Moomin Troll. He stood there a long, long time while time itself grew weary and his thoughts were very big. At last he said, it was wonderful. May I come back and look at it another day? But Thingamy and Bob didn't answer. So he crawled under the hedge again, feeling a bit giddy in the pale daylight. He had to sit on the grass for a while to recover himself. Goodness gracious me, he repeated. I'll eat my tail if that isn't the king's ruby that the hobgoblin is still looking for in the craters of the moon. To think that this odd little couple have had it in their suitcase all the time. Just then the snork maiden wandered out into the garden and came to sit beside him. But Moomin Troll was so sunk in thought he didn't notice her. After a while she poked cautiously at the tuft of his tail. Oh! <laughs> It, it, it's you, said Moomin Troll, jumping up. The Snork Maiden smiled coyly. Have you seen my hair? she asked, patting her head. Yeah, all right, let's, said Moomin Troll absently. What is the matter with you? she asked. My dear little rose petal, I can't explain even to you, but my heart is very heavy. You see, Snuffkin has gone away. Oh, no, said the Snork Maiden. Yes, really. But he did say goodbye to me first, Moomin Troll replied. He didn't wake anybody else. They sat there on the grass for a while, the sun gradually warming their backs. Then Sniff and the Snork came out on the steps. Hello, said the Snork Maiden. Did you know that Snuffkin has gone south? What, without me? said Sniff indignantly. One must be alone sometimes, said Moomin Troll. But you're still too young to understand that. Where are the others? The Hemulin has gone to pick mushrooms, said the Snork. Muskrat has taken his hammock in because he thinks the nights are beginning to get cold. And then your mother's in a very bad mood today. Oh, angry or sad? Moomin Troll asked in surprise. More sad, I think, answered the Snork. Then I must go to her at once, said Moomin Troll. He found Moomin Mama sitting on the drawing sofa, looking most unhappy. What is it, mother? he asked. Oh, my dear, something terrible has happened, she said. My handbag has disappeared. I can't do anything without it. I've searched everywhere, but it isn't there. So Moomin Troll organised a hunt in which everybody but the muskrat took part. Of all 
unnecessary things, he said. Your mother's bag is the most unnecessary. After all, time passes and the days change exactly the same whether she has her bag or not. That's not the point, said Moomin Papa indignantly. I must confess that I feel most strangely towards Moomin Mama without her bag. I've never seen her without it before. Was there much in it? asked the Snog. No, said Moomin Mama. Only things we might need in a hurry, uh, like dry socks and sweets and string and tummy powder and so on. What reward do we get if we find it? Sniff wanted to know. Almost anything, said Moomin Mama. I know. Um, I, I, I'll give a big party for you and you can have nothing but cake for tea and nobody need wash or go to bed early. And after that, the search continued twice as hard. They hunted through the whole house. They looked under the carpets and under the beds, in the snow, the stove, in the cellar, up in the attic, on the roof. They searched the whole garden, the woodshed and down by the river. The bag was not to be found. Uh, perhaps you climbed a tree with it or took it with you when you went to have a bath, asked Sniff. But Moomin Mama only shook her head and wailed. Oh, unhappy day. Then Snork suggested putting an advertisement in the paper, which they did. And the paper came out with two big items of news on the front page. Snufkin leaves Moomindale, mysterious departure at dawn, and then in slightly bigger letters... Moomin Mama's handbag disappears. No clues. Search in progress. Biggest ever August party as reward to finder. As soon as the news had got about, a huge crowd collected in the wood on the hills and by the sea, and even the smallest forest rat joined in the hunt. Only the old and infirm stayed at home, and the whole valley echoed with shouting and running. Dear me, said Moomin Mama, what an upheaval. But she was secretly rather pleased about it. What's all the bus about? asked Thingamy. My handbag, of course, dear, said Moomin Mama. Your black one, asked Thingamy, that you can see yourself in and has poor little pockets. What did you say? asked Moomin Mama, who was far too excited to list properly. The black one with poor pockets, repeated Thingamy. Yes, yes, said Moomin Mama. Run out, play, dears. So don't worry me now. What do you think? asked Bob when they got into the garden. I can't bear to see her so miserable, said Thingamy. I suppose we must bake it tack, said Bob with a sigh. Potter witty, it was so nice to sleep in the pittle lockets. So Thingamy and Bob went to their secret hiding place, which nobody had discovered yet, and pulled Moomin Mama's bag out of a rose tree. It was exactly twelve o'clock when they went through the garden, dragging the bag between them. The hawk caught sight of the little cavalcade and went off at once to spread the news all over Moomin Valley. And soon the stop press news announced Moomin Mama's handbag found by Thingamy and Bob. Touching scenes in Moomin House. Is it really true? Moomin Mama burst out. Oh, how wonderful. Where did you find it? In a trosery, began Thingamy. It was so nice to sleep, but just then lots of people came rushing in to congratulate them. Moomin Mama never found out that her bag had been used as a bedroom by Thingamy and Bob, and perhaps that was just as well. After that, nobody could think of anything but the big August party which was to be held that night. And everything had to be done to get ready before the moon rose. Oh, how nice it is to prepare for a party that you know will be fun and to which all the right people are coming. Even the muskrat showed some interest. You should have a lot of tables, he said. Little tables and big tables in unexpected places. Nobody wants to sit still in the same place at such a big party. There will be more fidgeting than usual, I'm afraid. And first you must offer them all the best things you have. Later on, it's all the same what they have, because they'll be enjoying themselves anyway. Don't disturb them with songs and so on. Let them make the programme themselves. And when the muskrat had produced this surprising piece of worldly wisdom... He retired to his hammock to read a book on the uselessness of everything. What shall I wear? the snork maiden asked Moomin Troll nervously. The blue feather hair decoration or the pearl diadem? Take the feathers, he said. Just the feathers around your ears and ankles. Possibly two or three stuck in the tuft of your tail. Thanking him, she rushed away and collided in the doorway with Snork, who was carrying some paper lanterns, who muttered crossly about the uselessness of sisters before he strode on into the garden began hanging the lanterns in the trees. Meanwhile, the Hemulin was arranging firework set pieces in suitable places. They had Bengal lights, 
blue star rain, silver fountains and rockets that exploded with stars. This is so terribly, dreadfully exciting, said the Hermelin. Couldn't we just let one off to try it? It wouldn't be visible in the daylight, said Moomin Papa, but take a squib and let that off in the potato cellar if you like. Moomin Papa was busy on the veranda making punch in a barrel. He put in almonds and raisins, lotus juice, ginger, sugar and nutmeg flowers, one or two lemons and a couple of pints of strawberry liqueur to make it especially good. Now and then he had a taste. It was very good. That's a pity about one thing, Sniff remarked. We haven't any music. Snuffkin isn't here. Oh, we'll use the wireless, said Moomin Papa. You'll see. Everything will be all right. We'll drink the second toast in Snuffkin's honour. Whose is the first, then? asked Sniff, hopefully. Thingamy and Bob's, of course, said Moomin Papa. The preparations were getting more and more frenzied. The entire population of the valley, the woods, the hills and the shore were coming with food and drink, which they spread out on the tables in the garden. There were big piles of gleaming fruit, huge plates of sandwiches on the bigger tables, and on tiny little tables under the bushes there were ears of corn, berries threaded on straws, and clustered of nuts nestling in their own leaves. Mim and Mama put the fat for frying the pancakes in the bathtub because there was enough basins, and then she carried up eleven enormous jars of raspberry juice from the cellar. The twelfth had been cracked, I'm sorry to say, when the Hemilin let off his squib. But it didn't matter. Think of me and Bob licked up most of it. When it was dark enough to light the lanterns, the Hemilin beat the gong as a signal for the party to begin. Think of me and Bob were sitting at the top of the biggest table. Fancy, they said. So much bus and fother all in our honour. Can't understand it. At first it was very solemn, as everyone was dressed in their best, and felt a bit strange and uncomfortable. They greeted each other and bowed, saying, What a good thing it didn't rain, and fancy the bag being found and nobody dared to sit down. And then Moomin Papa made a little opening speech, in which he began by explaining why the party was being held, and then he thanked Thingamy and Bob, after which he made some remarks about the short August night, how everyone should be as happy as possible. Uh, then he began to talk about what it was like in his youth, and this was the signal for Moomin Mama to push in a whole trolley full of pancakes, and everyone clapped. Things at once began to liven up. Soon the party was in full swing. The whole garden, in fact the whole valley, was full of small lighted tables sparkling with fireflies and glowworms. The lanterns in the trees swung to and fro like big shining fruit in the evening breeze. And the rockets began proudly leaping up into the August sky and exploding infinitely high up in a rain of white stars which slowly sank down over the valley. All the little animals lifted their noses up to the starry rain and cheered. Oh, it was wonderful. Then the blue star rain began to fall and the Bengal lights whirled over the treetops. Down the garden path came Moomin Papa rolling the big barrel of red punch in front of him and everyone came running down with their glasses. Moomin Papa filled everyone, cups and bowls and birch bark, mugs and shells, even cornets made of leaves. Good health to Thingamy and Bob, cried the whole of Moomin Valley. Hip, hip, hurrah! Hip, hip, hurrah! Hip, hip, hurrah! Duppy Hayes, said Thingamy to Bob, and they drank each other's health. Then Moomin Troll got up on a chair and said, Now I want to drink the health of Snuffkin, who is trekking south tonight, all alone, but feeling, I am sure, as happy as we are here. Let us wish him a good pitch for his tent and a light heart. And on that everyone raised their glasses. You did speak well, said the Snork Maiden when Moomin Troll sat down. Oh, well, he replied shyly, of course I'd thought it all out beforehand. Then Moomin Papa carried the wireless out into the garden and tuned in to dance music from America. And in no time the valley was filled with dancing and jumping and stamping and twisting and turning. The trees were thronged with dancing spirits, and even stiff-legged little mice ventured onto the dance floor. There is a lovely picture to look at, so let's pause for that. I'll leave it, you can have a little look, and see if you can spot some of your favourite characters. You can maybe see the stars and the moon shining down on a table with Moomin making his speech, I think. The snork is listening and so is everyone else. Lovely picture. If you've got a copy of this book, you really should spend a little while looking at it. However, it is time to press off. 
Moomin Troll bowed low to the Snork Maiden. He said, may I have the pleasure? But as he looked up, he caught sight of a shining light brimming over the treetops. It was the August moon. It sailed up, deep orange colour, unbelievably big, a little frayed around the edges like a tinned apricot, filling Moomin Valley with mysterious lights and shadows. Look, tonight you can even see the craters on the moon, said Snork Maiden. They must be awfully desolate, said Moomin Troll. Poor Hobgoblin up there hunting. If we had a good telescope, couldn't we see him? asked the Snork Maiden. Moomin Troll agreed, but reminded her of their dance, and the party continued with more high spirits than ever. Are you tired? asked Bob. No, said Thingamy, I'm just thinking. Everyone has been so nice to us. We must try to rue something in to turn. They whispered together for a while, and then they nodded, whispered again, and then they went off to their secret hiding place. When they came out, they were carrying the suitcase between them. It was well after twelve o'clock, and the whole valley was suddenly filled with a pinky red light. Everyone stopped dancing as they thought it was a new firework, but it was only the opening of Thingamy and Bob's suitcase. The king's ruby lay shining in the grass, looking more beautiful than ever, making the fire, the lanterns, and even the moon look pale and wan in comparison. Awestruck and speechless, they all crowded around the glowing jewel. To think anything could be so beautiful, exclaimed Moomin Mama. Sniff heaved a deep sigh and said, Lucky thing of me and Bob. Meanwhile, the king's ruby was shining like a red eye in the dark earth, and up in the moon, the hobgoblin caught sight of it. He had given up searching. He sat tired and sad on the edge of a crater, resting himself while his black panther slept a little way off. He recognised the red point down on the earth at once. It was the biggest ruby in the world, the King's Ruby, which he'd been hunting for for several hundred years. He started up and with gleaming eyes pulled on his gloves and fastened his cloak around his shoulders. He dropped all his other jewels to the ground. The hobgoblin only troubled himself about one single precious stone and that was the one he would hold in his hands in less than half an hour. The panther threw himself into the air with his master on his back and they began to hurtle through space, faster than light. Hissing meteors cut across their path. Stardust caught in the hobgoblin's cloak like driving snow. It seemed to him that the red fire below burned more brightly. He steered right towards the Valley of the Moomins and with a last spring, the panther landed smoothly and silently on the top of Lonely Mountain. The inhabitants of the valley were still sitting in silent awe in front of the king's ruby. In its flame they seemed to see all the wonderful things that they had ever done and longed to remember and do them once more. Moomin Troll remembered his midnight rambles with Snuffkin. The Snorg Maiden thought of her proud conquest of the Wooden Queen. Moomin Mama imagined herself once more lying on the warm sand in the sunshine looking up at the sky between the swaying heads of the sea pinks. Each one was far away, lost in wonderful memories, when they were all startled by a little white mouse with red eyes who slunk out of the wood and scurried towards the king's ruby, followed by a cool black cat which stretched itself out in the grass. As far as anyone knew, a white mouse had never lived in Moomin Valley, nor a black cat either. Psh, psh, psh said the Hemulin, but the cat only shut its eyes. It didn't bother them to answer. Then a wood rat said, oh, Good evening, cousin. But all she got from the white mouse was a long melancholy stare. So Moomin Papa came forward with two cups, wanting to offer the newcomers a drink from the barrel, but they took no notice of him. A sudden gloom crept over the valley. People whispered and wondered. Thingamy and Bob got anxious, put the ruby back in their suitcase and shut the lid. But when they tried to take it away, the white mouse stood up on his hind legs and began to grow. He grew almost as big as Moomin House. He grew into the red-eyed hobgoblin with white gloves. And when he'd grown enough, he sat down on the grass and he looked at Thingamy and Bob. Go away, you mugly old Anne, said Thingamy. Where did you find 
the king's ruby asked the hobgoblin mind your own business said bob they had never seen thingamy and bob being so brave i have hunted it for three hundred years said the hobgoblin i'm not interested in anything else nor are we said thingamy you can't take it away from them, said Moomin Troll. They got it quite honestly from the grope, but he didn't mention how they had exchanged it for the Hobgoblin's own old hat. Anyway, he did seem to have a new one. Give me something to munch, said the Hobgoblin. This is getting on my nerves. Moomin Mama at once bustled forward with pancakes and jam. She gave him a big plateful. While the Hobgoblin was eating, they edged a little closer. Someone who eats pancakes and jam can't be so awfully dangerous. You could talk to him. Does it taste good? asked Thingamy. Yes, thanks, said the Hobgoblin. I haven't had a pancake for the last 85 years. And at once everyone felt sorry for him and came still closer. When he had finished, he wiped his moustache and said... I can't take the ruby away from you because that would be stealing. But can't you exchange it for, let's say, two diamond mountains and a valley full of mixed precious stones? No, said Thingamy and Bob. And you can't give it to me, asked the hobgoblin. No, no, they repeated. The hobgoblin sighed. And then he sat for a while thinking and looking very sad. At last he said, Well, go on with your party, and I'll cheer myself up by working a little magic for you. Everyone shall have a piece of magic for himself. Now you can all have a wish. Moomin family first. Moomin Mama hesitated a bit. Should it be something you can see, she asked, or an idea, if you know what I mean, Mr Hobgoblin? Oh, yes said the hobgoblin things are easier of course but it will work with an idea too then i want to wish that moomin troll will stop missing snuffkin said moomin mama oh dear said moomin troll going pink i didn't know it was so obvious but the hobgoblin waved his cloak once and immediately the sadness flew out of moomin troll's heart his longing just became expectancy and that felt much better I've got an idea, he cried. Dear Mr Hobgoblin, uh, make the whole table and with everything on it fly away to Snuffkin wherever he is just now. And at the same moment the table rose up into the air and headed south with pancakes and jam and fruit and flowers and punch and sweets. Also the muskrat's book which he'd left on the corner. Hi, said the muskrat. I should like my book spirited back again, please. Right, said the Hobgoblin. Here you are, sir. On the usefulness of everything, read the muskrat, but this is the wrong book. The one I had was about the uselessness of everything. But the hobgoblin only laughed. Surely it's my turn now, said Moomin Papa. And it's very difficult to choose. I've thought of masses of things, but nothing is exactly right. A hobgoblin, a, a greenhouse is more fun to make yourself. A dinghy too. Perhaps, I, besides, I've got nearly everything. Perhaps you don't need a wish at two. I said, Sniff, I could have yours. Oh, well, said Moomin Puffer, I'm not sure about that. You must hurry up, dear, asked Moomin Mama. What about a nice pair of really nice book bindings for your memoirs? Oh, that is a good idea, said Moomin Papa happily. And everyone screamed with delight when the hobgoblin handed over two red Morocco leather and gold bindings set with pearls. Now, this is the wrong page, but you should see this picture of the table rising up to fly to Snufkin. And you can see all the wonderful things on the table. A terrific picture. Remember, Moomin Troll wished for the table to rise up and fly to wherever Snufkin was. Good heavens, it's been half an hour I've been reading this. It must be nearly time to finish. I should crack on. Me now! Squeak Sniff. A boat of my very own, please. A boat like a shell with purple sails and a jacaranda mast and rowlocks made of emeralds. That was quite a wish, said the hobgoblin kindly and waved his cloak. They all held their breath. But the boat didn't appear. Didn't it work? asked Sniff in disappointment. Well, indeed it did, said the hobgoblin. But of course I put it down on the beach. You'll find it there in the morning. With rowlocks made of emeralds, asked Sniff. Certainly. Four of them. One in reserve, said the hobgoblin. Next one, please. Hmm, 
Hmm, said the heavy To tell you the truth, there was a botanising spade I borrowed from the snork that got broken, so I simply must have a new one. And he curtsied. Uh, Hemulin always curtsies because he looks silly to bow in a dress. He curtsied in a well-brought-up manner when the hobgoblin produced the new spade. Don't you get tired of working magic? asked the snork maiden. Oh, not with these easy things, answered the hobgoblin. And what will you have, my dear young lady? It really is very difficult, asked the snork maiden. May I whisper? When she'd whispered, the hobgoblin looked a little surprised. He asked, Are you sure you want that to happen? Yes, sure, breathed the snork maiden. Well, all right then, said the hobgoblin. Here we go. The next moment, a cry of surprise went up from the crowd. The snork maiden was unrecognisable. What have you done to yourself? asked the Moomin Troll frantically. I wished for eyes like the wooden queen, said Snork Maiden. You thought she was beautiful, didn't you? Yes, but, but said Moomin Troll sadly. Don't you think my new eyes are beautiful, said the Snork Maiden, and she started to cry. Well, well, said the Hobgoblin, if they aren't right, then your brother can wish for the old eyes back again, can't he? Yeah, but I thought of something quite different, protested the snork. If she makes stupid wishes, it really isn't my fault. What had you thought of? asked the hobgoblin. A machine for finding things out, said the snork. A machine that tells you whether things are right or wrong, whether they're good or bad. That's too difficult, said the hobgoblin, shaking his head. I can't manage that. Well, in that case, I should like a typewriter, said the snork sulkily. My sister can see just as well with her new eyes. Yes, but she doesn't look so nice, said the hobgoblin. Dearest brother, cried the snork maiden, who'd got hold of the mirror. Please wish my little old eyes back again. I look so awful. Oh, all right, said the snork at last. You shall have them back for the sake of the family, but I hope you're a little less vain in the future. The snork maiden looked in the mirror again and cried with delight. Her funny little eyes were back in their place again, but her eyelashes had actually become... A little longer. Beaming all over her face, she hugged her brother and said, Sweetie pie, honey pot, you shall have a typewriter for a Christmas present from me. Oh, don't, said the snork, who was very embarrassed. One shouldn't kiss people, or when people are looking. No, I, I couldn't bear to see you in that awful state, that that's all. Aha! Uh -huh. Now only thing of me and Bob are left from the house party, said the whole woman. You shall have a joint wish, because I can't tell the difference between you. Aren't you going to wake a mish? asked Bob. I can't, replied the hobgoblin sadly. I can only give other people wishes and change myself into different things. Thingamy and Bob stared at him. Then they put their heads together and they whispered for a long time. Then Bob said solemnly, We've decided to wake a mish for you because you are nice. We want a booby as rootiful as ours. Everyone had seen the hobgoblin laugh, but nobody believed he could smile. He was so happy you could see it all over him, from his hat to his boots. Without a word, he waved his cloak over the grass, and behold, once more the garden was filled with a pink light. There on the grass before them lay a twin to the king's ruby, the queen's ruby. Now you're not miserable any more, said Bob. I should say not, said the hobgoblin tenderly, lifting up the shining jewel from his cloak. And now every single one of the animals shall wish for what he wants. I shall grant all your wishes before morning, because I have to be home before the sun rises. And that's how now they all had their own turn. In front of the hobgoblin there circled the long queue of chirping, laughing, humming forest creatures who all wanted to have their wishes granted. Those who wished stupidly were allowed another chance because the hobgoblin was in a very good temper. The dancing started again. More and more trolleyfuls of pancakes were wheeled out under the trees and the hemulin let off more and more fireworks and Moomin Papa carried out his memoirs in their smart new binding and read aloud about his youth. Never had there been such a celebration in the Valley of the Moomins. Oh, what a wonderful feeling when you have eaten up everything drunk everything and talked of everything and danced your feet off to go home in the quiet hour before the dawn to sleep and now the hobgoblin flies to the end of the world 
and Mother Mouse creeps into her nest, and one is as happy as the other. But perhaps the happiest of all is Moomin Troll, who goes home through the garden with his mother. Just as the moon is fading in the dawn and the trees are rustling in the morning breeze which comes up from the sea. It is autumn in Moomin Valley, for how else can spring come back again? There is Moomin Troll and his mother going home in the quiet hour before dawn. And that is the end of Thin Family Moomin Troll. So I shall have to close my book and say goodbye for now. But don't worry, I'm sure I'll be back with another book very soon. Until then, I'll leave you with the beautiful end papers. I don't know if this is the end papers from the original edition, uh, whether they were done just especially for this edition, but they are just lovely end papers. If you have a copy of the book, you may wish to enjoy looking at them. Until then, however, I must say goodbye. Look after yourself. Be kind and stay safe. See you all very soon. Bye bye.